So you've been tasked with planning the wine country trip of a lifetime, where to go, where to stay, how many wineries per day, should you get a driver, Napa, Sonoma, both. Don't worry. We have all the answers for you in SIP episode 120, and we do it with John Phillips of Inspiration Vineyards, planning the perfect wine country getaway. Sit back. SIP episode 120 begins now. This is all about, Cellar Angels really is all about wine country undiscovered. Because between Napa and Sonoma, there is just about 2,000 wineries. And unfortunately, about 85% of them don't have national distribution. So the only way you're going to learn about them is if you go to wine country and actually get exposed to them. And that's our specialty because we've been going to wine country for 20 years. We have 60 plus trips to Napa and Sonoma. We owned a bricks and mortar wine store where we got really, really frustrated by the fact that many of these great wineries weren't represented in the distribution system. So in 2010, we said, F that, we're going to found Cellar Angels. And now we give these wonderful wineries a marketplace to reach national consumers like you. So what are we talking about now? We're talking about how to have a successful trip to wine country. Uh, there are many, many, many do's and don'ts, and we have made quite a few mistakes of our own. Uh, so we are going to, with the expert guidance and shepherding and experience of tonight's guest, walk you through kind of some things to have in mind uh, ahead of, from a planning perspective, during, from a participation perspective, and then actually post it. Uh, from an enjoyment perspective. So without much further ado, I would love to bring in tonight's guest who's having some AV challenges. So he may be popping video on and off, but ladies and gentlemen, it's good friend of Cellar Angels, great friend of the ambassador to the wine industry, John Phillips from Inspiration Vineyards. Thank Cheers. you, Martin. Cheers, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, Martin, I, you know, for, for everyone's uh, benefit, um, we first started selling wine to Martin and Denise at their wine shop in Chicago. Um, and I was self-distributing. And that was the only way that I was able to get my wines into some really cool places into Chicago was to make a couple of trips a year and actually pound the pound the doors and say, no, no, I really am self-distributing. If you put an order with me, I'm the guy you're going to talk to and I'm going to get it here. So that was, um, yeah, I, I understand that frustration. Yes, it, it is. It's infuriating because, and it's interesting because now you have two distributors in the United States that control about 75% of all the wine you see in restaurants, in retail, in big box stores. So there really is a homogenization of selection. You, you just don't get the, the variety that you should have. And so in 2010, we decided to do something about it because these small production winers were just woefully unrepresented and, and it didn't make us happy. So problem I, I solved. This sounds like a topic for another sip. <laughs> I could, I, I like that. It, it could be the, the three tier system and, and it's corruption of the industry. Karen, hello to you. Good to see you. So many Dahlia here. Awesome. Elaine is on. Elaine, you may have just seen her picture in future events. She is coming on because she's wanting to know what on earth have I got myself into. Uh, you will be fine. Jim B is here. Julie is here. Two experts in wine country travel. But I do want to talk, John, how does someone come to taste with you today versus, you know, you self-distributing many moons ago? Well, um, so I, I'm in a transition period and we'll, we'll come talking more about that uh, probably further on. But at the moment, I'm really strictly by appointment and I'm not home often. And when I am home, um, you know, you just have to kind of catch me and, and make an appointment. The one downside of COVID was that uh, I I had a tasting room. I still have the tasting room at the winery, but um, I had it staffed. And because of COVID, I closed that, obviously. And after COVID, the person that, that I loved to death that was running it for me work, was now working for a, another winery and actually a nicer winery. Um, she still <laughs> helps me out when, when necessary. But uh, just looking at, you know, we're in a business park. It, industrial space. We're no longer at the vineyard property when I first met you and, and Denise. Um, so it really doesn't make sense to, to have someone there all the time because we don't get a lot of traffic. And um, at this point, I'm also out of the country a lot. So I just do a by appointments and, and then 
Um, what are the other thing that works is when I have customers that I've known for years call me up and say, hey, can you come visit? Can you bring wine? Can you, we'll host a party. And so I'll be doing two of those, uh, one next week in Utah at Park City, and I get to ski a little. And then at the, in March, first week in March, I'll be going to Colorado and cooking for about two dozen people and skiing oh, wow. uh, in Colorado. And I take wine and usually sell a lot of wine direct to folks. I think we're going to have some folks jumping on today that, that that's hosted me in Illinois. And so I basically try to do now private hosting parties. Um, and that's kind of how I've evolved uh, the experience of, of introducing my wines. And, and I'm noticing the theme here that if you happen to live in a ski destination, there's a greater likelihood that you will come visit those people. You know, you're very astute, Martin, <laughs> very astute. Um, right now, I'm not in either of my home offices. I'm in the third home office up in the mountains, and I did get a day of skiing in today. Yes, I, I must that admit, is that is a passion of mine, and I'm able to work that in with wine. So there you go. I would be remiss if we didn't announce this week's trivia winner. The question was, the road in Napa Valley on which you never want to make a left turn. And the answer is Highway 29. And it is brutal. And MJ, you were the fastest correct answer. Now you can read something into that. Like there may have been faster answers that were wrong, which could be true. Uh, and MJ is present this evening. So a hundred loyalty points are being placed in your account. So congratulations. Uh, also to clarify, MJ, while we don't offer extra credit, he provided some on residual sugar, refers to any leftover or unfermented and perceptible sugar remaining in a wine after the fermentation process. And RS may be perceptible, may not be perceptible. What was that? May not be. From, may not be. May not be. He is correct. It's from correct. Monday's newsletter. So we appreciate, that's what the angels are. The, you know, there's a great book. I think it was Spencer Johnson. How full is your bucket? So in life, there's dippers and there's fullers. The <laughs> dippers are the ones that take things from you. The fillers are the ones that give you value, fill you up with things, joy, authenticity, pride. AJ's a, joy, AJ's a or MJ's a dipper. I'm sorry, a filler. He's giving us extra credit. I love that about the angels. You guys are awesome. All right, so- First tip, I think I have to go to the PowerPoint because we have a deck for travel planning. Mission Control went all out on this. Uh, so, and I'm going to, there's a couple trivia questions we're going to get to in a second, and I will answer those. But before we go to the PowerPoint, show of hands, how many people have been to wine country? <laughs> okay, that's a, it's most everyone. That's pretty good. Very impressed. Uh, so at, we'll do that again when I can see people, but I think for now, everyone kind of cautiously raising their hand was fun. Uh, and I see some joy over there on the right hand side and some hand clapping. All right. So let's talk about things that you need to do and plan and you don't need to take notes. We're going to actually publish this on Monday to our YouTube channel. Uh, but so starting out, you have to choose which time of year you want to go. There are, and, and the angels mission control and I've been, I think think to wine country in every single month over the year. So we've got experience in all of them. Uh, there are pros and cons, and it all depends on kind of what you want to do really and, and the trip you want to have. So you go into summer and fall and it's the pro is the weather by, by all means. You, you're pretty much assured sunshine, you know, with 85% chance. The vineyards look like they do. They look like, okay, John, go ahead. So as much as I completely agree with you, I would say the one caveat, especially in California, and, and I was just down in Ramona, Southern California, talking to their Vintners Association earlier in the week. You know, in the fall, it's become a crapshoot with wildfires. I'm not trying to put anything out on that, but, you know, we've had some really bad luck. And all of us in the industry feel that that it's not a matter of, of if now, it's just when. And it may be periodically that the fall trips may not be as perfect as uh, they once were. Just putting and, it up. Well, we'll put an asterisk next to that. Uh, beware okay. of fires. and But there's definitely pros to summer and fall, weather being one of them, uh, climate change excluded. Uh, there's also in, in summer and fall, a heck of a lot more activities. You know, you've got bottle rock, you've got all sorts of barbecues and tastings and all sorts of things. And then of course, harvest and harvest is a beehive of activity. 
Um, the cons, obviously, this is peak season. So the airfare is going to be more. Lodging is going to be more. It is more crowded and it is decidedly more crowded. Uh, tastings are a challenge. So you have to plan ahead. And John mentioned a second ago that his tastings are by appointment now. Uh, that's almost everyone. Without exception, there's very few places, maybe a castle here or there that just lets busloads come in. Um, wink, wink. Uh, the large ones that make 150,000 or 500,000 cases, you might be able to walk into there and stand six deep at a tasting room. Just about everyone else is by appointment only. Uh, the other thing about fall, in addition to wildfires, is might be a con. Access to John is probably much more limited in October, late September and early October, because he's involved in harvest. He might be in the vineyards. Mm. Given what I'm doing now, that actually might be the best time. I did more of my tastings in between bringing in loads of fruit this fall because I was gone all summer. So, awesome. you know, it depends on what the winemaker's priorities are. And if 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 you've got a winemaker living in the United States 100% of the time, then no problem. But if you've got someone that travels a lot, I, I have to say that is a, that is definitely a pro. You, you know, you could probably find people at the winery. And, and yep. especially if you've established a relationship um, you know, if, if we, if I know a customer, I'll be there for you. So, yeah. And that's a good point. And, and it gets back to, um, pre-arranging things yes, and exactly. phoning in advance, emailing in advance. Uh, you can't do any of this stuff with quality wineries last minute. Correct. Now, winter and spring, uh, several pros here as well, far less crowds. Uh, lower airfare, lower lodging, better access to the wineries and stuff like that. And, and it all depends on what you want. Again, the cons though are the vineyards are sparse. If you look at the vineyards today in, in February, uh, if they haven't pruned yet, you, you still have all the growth from last year that needs to come off. And there's no foliage on the vines. There is no beautiful romantic clusters of grapes waiting to be harvested. So there is that. Weather is much cooler uh, you can get, and I've seen it, and I'm sure John has seen it too. I mean, people that go in the summer, they think they've just left a cold weather climate and they're getting sun for the first time and they don't bring sunscreen and they get fried. And it is, it is kind of funny, but November to March as a con is sometimes the wet season. So you, you have to take your chances there. The pros, you're going to probably save a ton of money on airfare and lodging, but you, the, the weather is a little bit more of a crapshoot. Anything to add on that slide? Um, you're going to get some really good intimate experiences uh, at wineries. And, you know, the other thing too, is that if, you know, if, if this group that we're talking to now are avid travelers, um, you know, you can always go to New Zealand and Australia during this time. Of year, <laughs> which is, but in, in seriousness, um, I would say that, you know, again, climate change has, has created drier winters. Um, sure, we'll get a ton of rain all at once, but then things dry out. Sun is out. Um, last week, the sun was out. Um, the mustard starts to bloom right now, so the fields are full of yellow and, and beautiful mustard. So I would say that it's a good time to come. Oops, excuse me. Oh, I have a cough. So. All good. So I understand. Let me see if I can see a question here. Mr. G, can you comment on the differences between early summer, John, versus mid to late summer? Is June better than August? Also, what days are better? Uh, not everything is open on every day. Two great mm -hmm. questions. Very good question. Um, I pick May, June are, are always my favorite months in general in the wine country, um, especially because, again, things are green. And you have, you know, foliage starting to grow in the canopies. Um, the fall, you know, late October and November is, is quite pretty. So you start getting to the end of the shoulder of the summer and into harvest. And the canopies start turning red and look really pretty. Um, and then, you know, right now, as I cough, I'm, I'm getting over a cold. So apologies for everybody. You're still on mute right now. Um, yeah. I would say this time of time of year, you know, you get into mid to late February into March. And if you can miss the rain, it's quite beautiful. And what's nice is the tasting rooms themselves have less people. Correct. Um, you can probably get in and have more intimate experiences. Um, the one thing to consider is that there are also a lot of regional wine association events this time of year as well, because they're trying to bring people into the winery. 
So if you don't want crowds, you just have to kind of look at the calendar and see what's going on during those periods as well. And it's, I am I myself, since I'm industry, am kind of a big fan of the October, November because of the access to the winemakers and there's less crowds and we can knock out five or six meetings in a, in a day very easily in October, November for luxury, for beauty, for warmth, for foliage, for long nights of sunshine. I'm also in, I, I'm fond of the June timeframe. It's not mm -hmm. scalding hot. Cellar Angels took some incredibly great customers to wine country last year in July. I think we all lost weight because it was about 105 degrees in the shade. And, uh, but it was still beautiful and it cools off at night. As you've heard us talk about for years now, it, it cools off at night because of the Pacific, the San Pablo Bay, and it is delightful. So uh, pick your time of year and, and with the <clears throat> couple of people you're going with, and then you're going to need some planning tips. As we just got done saying, make reservations far in advance. You, you probably can't make them too far in advance. Uh, just to get something on a calendar. And it's for everything. It's not just for wineries. It's for restaurants. It's for car uh, uh, service. It's for lodging. It's basically anything you want to do, they're going to require a reservation, if at all possible. Balloon rides. And by the way, if you haven't done a balloon ride in wine country, highly recommend it. It's unreal. It's, it is probably one of the best experiences. And, and again, if you What's really interesting about the balloon ride situation also is that there are different times of year where the balloons are not flying. So that's also something to be considered. Um, Great point. Late summer, early fall, they are always up in the air. October, November, especially in Sonoma County, they take off at the airport and they go south. And sometimes they, they will fly over my old property. Um, and I've taken that trip. It's, it's a gorgeous trip. Um, and I highly recommend it. One other thing I was also going to mention too is that um, if you are going to hire a car service or someone to take you around or even an Uber, one, thing's, one thing to keep in mind is that since the pandemic is over, but since COVID is over, we have less Uber drivers and less um, kind of on the fly drivers in Sonoma and Napa County now than we used to. So it's really important to book a taxi or a car service in advance because you may think, oh yeah, I can just you know hop on a, a lift and there's no right. one there to pick you up. Interesting. Great point. Uh, airports. You just talked about balloon rides from airport. Uh, flying into SFO. I mean, obviously a major international airport. Uh, it's fantastic. You can get anywhere in the world from SFO and probably one stop. Uh, it's less pricey, has more options. But I will tell you, flying directly into Santa Rosa is about as good a dream as you can imagine. You are literally in vineyards in four and a half minutes because you're landing in them. And it is just, uh, you probably have, there's a few direct flights from Denver and some of the uh, other Southwest Las Vegas and things like that, but you will probably be taking a connection. Um, but it is ideal. I mean, we've connected from Fort Myers to Phoenix, Phoenix to Santa Rosa. And and it sounds like that's more airtime, but keep in mind, when you land at SFO, you're 90 minutes from a winery. That's and, without the car. That's without arranging that's, the car. Correct. And that's and that's with decent traffic. Um, so, and I also know now that they're rerouting traffic that used to go through uh, Presidio. They're not going to be going through there to get back down to SFO. I cool. would, wow. Google Maps is not allowed to take people there th through there. So that's a new development. Interesting. So, Definitely check out Santa Rosa if you can find a way to work that into the itinerary. And it's it's the most hysterical airport uh, because it has one terminal, quasi terminal, two maybe, uh, and and a pretty nice bar. And the bar is indoor outdoor, which is a bonus. So so some news on that. Um, uh -oh. The bar is getting changed. There's a lot of controversy about that right now. So I don't know who the new managers will be, but apparently there that has recently happened. And also the other really sad development that happened um, late last year is that United is no longer running flights directly into Santa Rosa. So that right. kind of killed the Denver trip. And let me tell you, I, flying to Denver was great. I mean, Tracy could drop me off at the curb. We're 10 minutes from the airport. I'm on the flight, you know, literally within 10, 15 minutes. And then, then you just had to change planes and SFO to, to Denver. But um, I, I don't know when United is going to come back, but American flies, Alaska flies, 
Um, and I think one other budget carrier flies um, in and out, but United now has disconnect, discontinued. Interesting. Uh, we're going to get into itinerary planning here in a second, and it, I'm, we're going to tell you to select a quadrant, and you'll see why I'm talking about <laughs> that when you schedule tastings. Look at where lunch and dinner are and, and base your dinner specifically as close to where your lodging is and your last winery as possible. Too many people, I've seen this so many times where they, they're like, oh, we're going to go to Calistoga one day. And then we've got a tasting in Sonoma later that afternoon. That's an hour and 40 minutes. Stay out of the car. So we've put together a handy little map for you to kind of pinpoint how you're going to do your, your day. And it looks like this. Just generally, this is like the uh, gap principles for wine tasting itineraries, generally acceptable principles. Divide Napa and Sonoma into a quadrant because you can see as, as big as Napa is, Sonoma is twice as large. And you can actually, you know, stick in this quadrant for your three tastings or maybe four tastings. It's great if you're staying in Yountville because you can get north and south very, very easy. If you're staying in St. Elena, you're going to want to stay up in this area because then you've got Calistoga wineries. You can go even further north into Knights Valley. Um, and you can, there's a ton of stuff to do in and around St. Elena. So this is an idea of how to spend the most amount of time at wineries and the least amount of time in your car. John. Um, I completely agree. We've talked about this before. Um, and I've even kind of coached some of your customers who've called to make appointments. Um, you know, just to, if you have your pointer over to where St. Helena and Calistoga is, um, you can get over the hill in 30 minutes to Santa Rosa. Um, yep. And then that's what drops you off into Russian River Valley. Um, and so, again, if you are looking at it's kind of like north, you know, if you if you really want best of both counties, um, then probably north is really the way where to go. You know, stay either in Santa Rosa. There's plenty of accommodations there or stay um, up in Calistoga or St. Helena area because you can get over the hill very quickly. Um, but, you know, to go from St. Helena down to the city of Napa or into Carneros, it's it's an hour plus. Um, yeah. And that's on a good day with traffic. Same thing. If you're in Santa Rosa wanting to get down to um, Sonoma Valley, especially down to the town of Sonoma, that's 45 minutes to an hour, depending upon traffic. And people don't take that into consideration. And I think that, um, you know, I, I always tell people, like, plan your, you know, plan your day experience in the area where you're going to be, you know, because spending time in the car is ridiculous. And it, and it, yeah. there's a lot of traffic. So, and, and this is a, this is a vast area right here. Like last week we had the crux boys on, you know, and they're located right in here. You could even do this. Oopsie. You can throw a grid on this area. Yeah. Because there is a ton of stuff as John knows in Russian river, there's 50 wineries just in this little grid right here. Easy. And so don't, I see too many people spending too much time traversing the counties and they're spending hours upon hours in their car. And, and we did that early on and we, we finally got smart about it. And you can, I mean, Hillsburg is a great place to be a launching pad. Even um, Cloverdale, Geyserville up in here, it's not on the map, is a good place to be a launching pad to go north. And like John mentioned, going from Santa Rosa right here, right yep. over, over the mountain, it drops you right down to the Calistoga over here. Yep. You can do the same thing from Healdsburg. It, it goes mm -hmm. around. Um, you know, around Jordan and comes back down through Knights Valley yep. and, you, and you're right into Napa. So you could spend your whole time up in this area and see tons of wineries and, and get a lot of quality in for the visits without spending too much time behind the wheel. I completely agree. I was going to, I'm going to launch into something else once you start talking about the number of visits. Okay. Um, wine tasting reservations. We've hit upon this. Uh, we think three per day, leisure and luxury are the motives. Uh, you can do quantity. You're just not going to have as fun a time or as quality a visit. And for everything at Cellar Angels over the last 13, you know, 13 years, you know, we're all about quality uh, versus quantity per se. So spend more quality time in each tasting appointment and less time in the car. You should plan on and call ahead to say how long is the tasting. Uh, because they're generally an hour and a half to two hours. 
So if you are sitting down, like John just mentioned <laughs> earlier, his are by appointment only. So he's going to go in, open up the tasting room, have a bunch of wines open, probably some bread and something to nosh on and th- something like that. And you're going to sit down and get a tour of each wine. That's not going to be 15 minutes. No. What were you going to say, John? And so, so on that point, and this is something that um, we've seen kind of really develop over the last 10 years, and that is that um, a number of the larger wineries, and when I say larger wineries that are really well-funded wineries, are starting to really create experiences where you're going to get the cheese and wine pairing. Um, you're going to be expected to be there for two hours to get your money's worth. Um, the wines, the, the tastings themselves are are becoming very, very expensive. So again, if your interest is to try to find unique small lot production wines, try to look for small producers that do have really intimate tastings. Maybe all they will have is, are breadsticks and some really terrific wines. But, but you know, sometimes I, I think that some of the larger wineries forget that the idea is to sell wine. As a winemaker, my goal is to try to sell wine to you. And I'm spending that time introducing you to my wines, hoping that you'll like them and buy them. When a person charges $50 to $75 for a tasting, you don't really feel that commitment to actually walk out with a few bottles after the tasting because you've had the experience. And so look for wineries that are offering more intimate experiences where it's about the wine and really not about all the glamour around the wine business. And I think that that's something that you know, a lot of the larger wineries are focusing around that glamour. Um, there's a winery up north that is a great winery, really nice facility, um, terrific wines. They have a restaurant and their owner happens to be a very successful movie movie maker. And the experiences are, are wonderful. You could get the cabana and sit out by the pool. If that's what you want in the wine country, great. That's, that's one way to look at it. Um, we call it the Disneyland experience in Napa. But my... My feeling is look for producers that you don't really hear about um, or hear about in small blogs and try to look them up. Um, I can name a a half dozen or a dozen right off the bat in Sonoma County and Dry Creek and and Russian River um, who they're friends and people that I find their wines really interesting and unique and you can't get them anywhere else other than at the winery. So that's, that's kind of the point of visiting small wineries when you come to the wine country. Completely agree. Uh, purchasing wine, since John just brought that up. Uh, this is gets to be somewhat of a, I don't want to say sensitive, but there's a, there's a period it's like, well, do I buy wine? Did we get a tasting? Did we pay for the <laughs> tasting? How much do I buy? How much? A couple of rules of thumb here. If you paid full price for a tasting, and I don't care if it was 40 bucks, 75 bucks, or 150 bucks, you are under no obligation to purchase wine. They are charging you a fee for that experience. So it's net neutral. Now, if you were blown away by something, absolutely grab a few bottles of it. That's what, like John mentioned, that's what they're there for to do is to sell wine. Uh, if you were comped a tasting or Cellar Angels arranged a tasting and that tasting is normally $100 for four people, uh, your purchase should be equal to or greater than the fee per person. So it, there is, it, it is a business. And I think everyone understands that. And when you have someone like John, the owner, actually taking time out from about a thousand other tasks to sit down and spend time with you. He's, and I'm not putting words in his mouth. He loves doing it. It's literally why we're all in the wine business is to bring people together and share great wines. Um, But at the end of the day, that time is money and that's valuable time. And so by all means, if do something with regards to, okay, that tasting was a hundred, there's four of us, let's all get a, a, two cases of wine, $400 or more if you were blown away by something. That's perfectly economical arrangement. Any additional thoughts, John? No, I, I think that, you know, it's funny as, a, as an owner, um, if I, and I'll be honest, I have a bias. If I, if I have a group of people coming in and they, they, they're just there for, you know, I'll use uh, kind of the wedding experience that they're, they're there to, to, for entertainment. They're not really there about wine, maybe two people really, let's go wine tasting and let's, you know, let's, let's spend out, you know, an afternoon out, a bunch of people. I find that if, you know, I, I don't have any problem charging them a small tasting fee. And my, my tasting fee has been like ridiculously inexpensive. I mean, $10, $15. I mean, it's been pretty damn cheap for, for years. Um, I think I finally got it to $20 and everyone, no one batted an eye and I'm like, okay, whatever. 
But if a group comes in and they're really engaged and really love the wines, they start buying wine, even if it's, you know, three, four people and they buy three bottles of wine, I'm like, you know, don't worry about the tasting fee. I, I waive it. And it's, it's selective, yes, but it's based on their interest and the kinds of questions that they asked. And um, if they really are engaged in the wines, and, and of course, if they join a wine club, then it's like, woohoo, you know, so it's, I don't push, but I do try to close. And to your point, Martin, when I first got into the wine business, I took a wine marketing class and, and uh, the woman asked, uh, the, the teacher of the, of the program, a professor um, at the, the college said, okay, um, tell me how all of you would close the visit. And everyone was like, you know, I don't know. And I, I looked around and I kind of raised my hand. She's like, what? I said, well, would you like to buy any wines today? And she's like, that is the number one thing that people don't do when they go to a winery is actually close with, would you like to buy some? Yeah, I'm putting a person on the spot, but at the same time, I am there to sell. And if they don't want to, that's fine. I, I'm you know totally okay with that. But you've got to be able to, you know, hopefully the, the, the staff will be a whole range of experiences that you will work with in the wine country. People who are really savvy, really experienced, and people who this is their first job out of college and, and they're a little timid. And so they may not want to close, but at the end of the day, you know, for me as a small producer, I've got to sell my wine. And so I've got to ask for every sale pretty much. Yep. Um, so that gives you a little bit of information on uh, purchasing. So now VIP tastings are something different. So VIP tastings, and these are predominantly the tastings that Cellar Angels arranges because they're 90% of the time with John or with the winemaker. They are oftentimes in private areas of either the winery or at someone's house or off in the vineyards or separated space. Um, if you're getting a VIP tasting from the owner and things of that nature, you should absolutely be buying wine uh, and six bottles or more depending upon what you're tasting and the price points of that. This is indeed, as John mentioned, their lifeblood. Now, a question has come up uh, quite often is what do I tip? And, and that is, I, I've seen two things happening in wine country that I'm somewhat displeased with is, first of all, the automatic checkout with the POS system to where you get done buying $400 of wine and they spin the thing around and they're waiting for you to put a tip down. Um, that I think is a little bit presumptuous. If, if you have been given a tasting by a staff member, absolutely slide that person some money, or if you want to put it electronically on the cash register, that's fine too. If you're getting a trip and a host and, um, tasting by the owner, if you give anything to the owner, he, he or she is usually just going to give it to the staff. Uh, so, so give it to the staff anyways, is what I'm saying. Thoughts, John? Absolutely correct, Martin. Um, as an owner, it's I've always felt a little funny when someone hands me a tip. It's like, well, right. I, I'm like, here, this is what I do, but I really appreciate it. And and I've tried giving it back and I'm, no, 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 keep it. I'm like, okay, so it'll go into a crew lunch, you know, or something. Yep. Um, it's really interesting. So I will say though, on the flip side, uh, the wine business doesn't pay well. And so for some of the larger wineries, uh, there are two ways that tasting room staff make more than the, the minimum wage that the winery is offering. And, and, and so oftentimes it's two things, the, the tips and um, it's wine club, per, the, the sign up or commissions on sales, whether it's, you know, paying them a certain amount per wine club sign up or a certain percentage of the total wine sale. So you can also kind of sometimes tell how they're being compensated based on how assertive they are in terms of the closing of the sale and joining the wine club. And again, it's, it's one of the realities that we've seen, especially in California. Um, you don't see it in Europe, but you do see it in California. And again, it's just how people have been compensated. Interesting. Peter, I think that answers your questions about does the staff member get a commission on the sale? I it, think it, might it varies by winery. I was going to say it might vary by winery and producer. So here's a couple other things with regards to setting up your tasting in your itinerary. Uh, 10 a.m., first tasting appointment, great time of day to taste. Uh, roads aren't as crowded, so that's a good time to be, you know, you've got an hour and a half for your tasting. Noon, put, pick lunch out somewhere. Plenty of places in both Napa and Sonoma that are 
country stores, Dry Creek Inn, uh, Soda Canyon Road, Gotts Roadside. These are all great places to just go grab a box lunch and box lunches in other parts of the country may be looked down upon. It is ideal for wine country. Many of the picnic areas and stuff, and many of the wineries will have outdoor picnic areas where you can bring in a box lunch and then buy a bottle of their wine uh, and sip and, and eat while you're dining. 1.30, second tasting appointment, 3.30, third tasting appointment. So when this third tasting appointment gets over, you're looking at five o'clock, which will get you potentially, John, as I said, is having video card problems, will get you potentially uh, close to your restaurant and then you can, or close to your lodging, then go to a restaurant. Uh, the other alternative is if one of the wineries is including lunch, and that happens a lot to where they will say, how many in your party? You know, it might be four people, six people. They'll have lunches for you. They'll have a charcuterie tray set up. Uh, so that's also a nice way to do it. And again, timing is everything. So you'll know just from if we if you do something in the quadrants that we talked about, and you're close to your hotel at the end of the day with the last tasting, it takes some art and skill to get a little lucky. Uh, but then you've got a 10, 15 minute drive back to your hotel, you freshen up for dinner, maybe a power nap, and uh, then you're good to go for the evening. Uh, it's, it's wash, rinse, repeat when you get out there. So all of this stuff is, is something that you can easily plan for. And this is, you should have your whole itinerary done weeks in advance. Completely agree. Uh, Miscellaneous tips. As we said, no left turns on Route 29. Uh, there's actually, I think, a tour company called No Left Turns in, in Napa uh, because it's so darn busy. And a little local trick is you will be, you can always take right turns. So you take the right turn, you get into the first left-hand turn lane you can, and you whip a U-turn. And oftentimes you're passing cars that you were behind trying to take a left turn. Uh, it is a nightmare on Route 29, especially when we talked about uh, summer months, you know, June, July, August, September. It's crazy how long you can wait to take a left turn. Uh, pro tip, use Silverado Trail as much as possible. And there's a bunch of things. Stay off 101 if you can. Use back roads, uh, Dry Creek, Healdsburg area. There's a bunch of different ways to get around other than the main thoroughfares. But Silverado Trail is a nice little alternate. It's parallel to Route 29. So you can go up Route 29 once or twice because we all do it. You're like, oh, there's Opus, there's Cake Bread, there's Peju, there's St. Supery. None of these are paid sponsors, by the way. Um, but there's a, a lot of ways to see these folks. But once you get off of Route 29, that's where the magic happens. Sonoma County, I think Chad mentioned this uh, in the comment line. People don't realize how big this area is. Sonoma County is huge compared to Napa. I mean, Russian River is massive and you can drive for 45 minutes and not get to the other side of it. And there's a ton of wineries in between. So map out the distance between appointments, make sure you have enough travel time put in, all stuff that sometimes we forget about. You, you throw it on your phone. You're like, whoa, this one's 55 minutes away. Did not see that coming. Yeah, big time. <laughs> if, if you if you can get a driver, Seller Angels has partnerships with uh, agencies that we can help introduce you to. Uh, very, very useful to get a driver, especially if you're going to cram in some more uh, tastings than three. And oftentimes, by the way, these drivers, they've got a VIG with the wineries. So they'll take you to wineries that uh, we may not know. And there's some special livery services in Napa <laughs> and Sonoma where they've got great relationships with very, very tiny producers. Uh, and it's worthwhile to get a driver because they can get you to places that maybe not even open by appointment, uh, but they know it. They have a special guy at a place and they'll do tastings there. So definitely get a driver. To streamline your day, uh, schedule tasting appointments that are combined with lunch. It's just much easier because that way you don't have to go to lunch, wait for service. Uh, even if you're going to In-N-Out Burger, uh, it, it takes time. But if you can have a tasting that has lunch with it, you get the added bonus of more time with the winery and wines paired with food. And they will 90% of the time pick foods that complement the wine. So you get the amped up experience in that capacity. Uh, that is a very, very not done yet. Wine country, I forgot about a tire. It's pretty casual, okay? Uh, leave the Manolo Blahniks at home. Uh, you don't need suit and tie type of things. I mean, if you go to the French Laundry, pretty fancy, but I don't even know if you need a tie there. It's it's wine country. It's, it's yeah, Chad's saying no. It, you know, no. sport coat at some places, maybe, um, but generally uh, leave the cargo shorts at home, but shorts sometimes good. Uh, summer musts, as we talked about earlier, I see so many people get 
scorched because the like I've got a receding hairline. So I've got to be very careful out there, which is why I uh, didn't happen 20 years ago. But um, also plenty Carry, of water. Carry bottled water. water. Yes, exactly. Uh, cool, rainy, you know, waterproof shoes and umbrella, because if you are going out in the vineyards and, you know, vineyards are very dusty, <laughs> you will be covered in dirt <laughs> from the standpoint <laughs> that you may not realize, wow, this is dirty out here. I mean, these are farmers. You're, you're walking in an agricultural field with the farmer. Uh, what better way to experience the crop than the person who's growing it, planting it, cultivating it, and you know, bringing it in? But it's it's not manicured lawns mostly, and you you will get dirty. So wear comfortable shoes. And also, a uh, great point: cave tours are cool. Caves are fifty to fifty five degrees, and if you're spending any time in there, have a wrap, have a windbreaker, have something because there's often cave tastings and you can get pretty chilly in a cave for an hour and, and not realize that your teeth are chattering. And it, it does kind of make the experience a little less enjoyable when your teeth are chattering. Um, and, and some wineries do their tastings in the, the, the cave, like pride does. I've got a group going out and we're having it in the actual cave. So yep. bring it your jacket. Chilly. All right, you are now equipped with a lot of knowledge on how to have, honestly, an unbelievable experience and save yourself from a lot of pain of windshield time. Uh, we have just enough time to do Google Earth and get you through polls. There's Nick S. Good to see you, brother. Uh, all right, so let's uh, talk inspiration. Well, not really inspiration. We couldn't come up with four. So we would like to know what your thoughts on, because there's a lot of winemakers here. Uh, <laughs> sign you're a wine country amateur. You show up in a bus. You are boasting about the commercial wineries you'll visit on 29. You have a Groupon voucher. Uh, I was I had another one that was probably not R-rated. So I left that one off. Um, but... I will let John or the winemakers chime in with an other, you know, what, cause there's a couple of winemakers on tonight on what would you think is a dead indication that you're a wine country amateur? I'm going to give this five, four, three, two, 1.5, one. All right. Before we, I'm going to go around Robin. Okay. <laughs> Kim and David, cause Kim was a wine maker had a winery now retired what was your number one indication that the people walking in were amateurs i was i was just telling david i think it's when they're wasted when they walked in the door <laughs> and then no what's even better is when i only have pinot noir open and they're like i only drink white wine i'm like well i only have pinot noir they're like i'll take it i'm like okay <laughs> you're done <laughs> uh Chad, any any tips that when you see a tasting group and you're like, uh oh, uh, when they're expecting the tasting to be free, like at Sutter Home, <laughs> so which is the last tasting room in Napa that is still for free. Wow! And there, speaking of Napa, there's an unwritten rule of winemakers and wineries; they will not except a tasting after Del Dotto. Because you do not leave Del Dotto standing. That's why they yeah. call it Del, Del Blotto. Yes. <laughs> we started Del there one day. Del done. Del done, exactly. Um, all right, John, what is your indication that this is, uh, this is going to be a rough tasting? Uh, <clears throat> generally, when they take the glass and they just gulp it down, like one... And then they're like, oh, um, how many wineries have you been? And then they're asking for the refill. Like, hmm. yeah. <laughs> Guilty. I've, I've done that. It, I, uh, I believe it's called a revisit. A re <laughs> yeah. When you gulp it down, it's a, it's a refill. When you've <laughs> tasted it very slowly and want, you, you want to pick up one more little thing, I'll take the revisit. But you have to, there's a fine line between revisit <laughs> and refill. All right. The second question. Oh, by the way, the results were all over the board. There was no <laughs> one winner. I actually think other had uh, the most. So 
Scientific tests indicate taste buds are most alert at what time? 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 4 p.m., after tequila. <laughs> Personally, it's after it's after bourbon for me, but okay. Bourbon. <laughs> All right. Five, four, no idea what I just did. Three. Oh, there we go. Two, one. Wow, this is a smart group. Uh, the correct answer is, in fact, after 10 a.m. or at 10 a.m. So uh, I don't know how that test was conducted, if there was mouthwash involved at 7 a.m. <laughs> or you know, no coffee. But apparently, uh, it is true, your taste buds are uh, freshest, most awake, most responsive, most receptible uh, at 10 a.m., which when is I go why into a lot winery when I go into the winery to taste lots, especially when I'm trying to do blending trials, um, I way prefer going in first thing in the morning, get things lined up, set up, and then 10 o'clock or thereabouts, 9.30 to 11 o'clock, some in that time frame, I'm going through and tasting lots and I'm spitting all the way through, but I'm way more effective in understanding what's going on with the wines at that hour in the morning than I am at four o'clock. I just, I'm done. I, I, I want to go back and have the bourbon at that point. So yeah. <laughs> my blending sessions are always like nine to noon. Agreed. Yeah. You see a lot of uh, Facebook posts of winemakers and stuff with their beakers and test tubes and cups. And it's always in the morning, yep. always in the morning. Uh, awesome. All right. Let's show you a little bit about where John is. So you are all familiar with this blue orb and I will show you where Napa and Sonoma reside for cellar angels. So now this is our playground and we love it. Uh, we've been featuring wines from here for, as I mentioned, since 2010. Uh, everything about this area we love because anytime you think you know something you don't. There's just so much undiscovered wine here. It's incredible. Napa has 1,200 commercially licensed wineries. Sonoma has about six to 800, dependent upon time of year. Geography-wise, as you can see, Napa could fit inside Sonoma. It's it's just a beautiful, beautiful area. Uh, for those of us that grew up in the Midwest, you can always tell the Midwest people, by the way, in January and February, because they're the ones with the convertibles in wine country, even though it's 50 <laughs> degrees. Um <laughs> Because they just left zero and zero to 50 is a huge difference. So, uh, but this is just a special place and you, you just have so much uh, geological influence with the San Pablo Bay, with the Pacific Ocean, with all of the maritime influences of all the lakes, the microclimates, uh, all the different AVAs. I think now each county has 17 AVAs, uh, but the, the tapestry that represents this soil is unlike anything in the world with uh, six of the 12 known soil types are in both of these counties. It's pretty impressive. And as I've mentioned in the past, uh, it is classified as a Mediterranean climate and only 3% of the globe has that classification. Uh, not surprisingly, most of them surround the Mediterranean, but what that does from a weather pattern is, is give you some predictability with regards to they know rainy season is going to be January through March, and many of you have seen the news clippings and video of just how much rain wine country in California has gotten. Uh, the inspiration tasting room that John referenced is, I believe, right here, if memory serves me correctly. Yes, it does. Um, so this is one of, I think, a newer trend as it relates to an industrial type wine tasting experience. And I can go right down here and drill in and hopefully plan this correctly. And there's the inspiration tasting room with a couple of barrels out front. Uh, there's a couple other tasting areas in here, but there's John, keep me honest here. There's production to the right and then tasting to the left. I don't know if you made any changes. That, that is correct. So if you walk in the doors, all of our production area is directly ahead. And then our tasting room is right off to the left. Um, and then you see my mower attachments and, and my late truck. I no longer have that truck, but yes, that is that is a harvest picture because the equipment's outside, and, and obviously we're we're probably in the middle of doing harvest when Google Earth drove through the parking lot. 
That's actually pretty cool. Quite honestly, that Google Earth is just driving through the parking lot. This, by the way, I think is illegal to have your farm equipment here. So uh, speak to me after class. Now, what we do now, we, we avoid all of that now because we just park a whole bunch of bins there during harvest and put put garbage bags over the handicap sign. I know. I'm no, really I'm sure, I'm sure during harvest, there's a, there's a lot of dispensation going on during harvest because there's stuff everywhere. So... I want you to tell people a little bit about inspiration, uh, the varieties that you specialize in. Um, so basically, I I got into the business wanting to make wine that I like to drink. And so a lot of the decisions around wines that I, I was producing really came about because these are wines that I enjoy. Um, the Rhone varietals, the Viognier that, that some of you are having today, um, is now the only white wine I produce. Uh, in 2017, I sold my vineyard property that had Chardonnay growing on it. So I was producing Chardonnay um, from 2002 until I sold the property um, in 2017. Um, so Viognier is our, our white wine and then Grenache Syrah. I've always been a Syrah fan and my production manager turned me on to this really beautiful Grenache vineyard in Sonoma, um, really kind of the Sonoma Coast ABA. Um, lots of fresh strawberry and fruit fruit notes. And I really love just having the balance of the two. Um, I got into Pinot Noir because of Sideways in 2002. Um, I, you know, everyone said, you need to make it, you need to make it. We had friends that grew it and they said, you need to make our Pinot Noir. And I absolutely just wasn't fond of making Pinot Noir. I like other people's Pinot Noirs. Um, but I just was never, I never felt comfortable um, dialing it in. And, and so one day, I'd, I'd given up making it. I took a couple of years off. And uh, one day this person came into my tasting room and said, uh, you know, you make beautiful Pinot Noir. I have a client that, that wants you to make Pinot Noir for him. And I just was like, okay, who, who are you? And then within a week I had a contract and I was making Pinot Noir for, for someone I, I didn't even know. And right off the bat, it, it was an award winner and the person loved it. And I thought, wow, something changed. I don't know. Maybe it's the fruit source. Don't know. So that led to me um, making Pinot Noir for myself. Again, hand selecting the sources of fruit where I was getting it. And next thing you know, I win best of class at Harvest Fair and I have to pull it from the sweepstakes because I didn't have enough. And it was pretty funny because in, in Sonoma County, we'd had two sweepstake winners, two previous years back to back, disgraced because they didn't have enough for the sweepstakes round and they won. And so when I pulled it, um, on the night of the awards, um, judges came up to me and said, why did you pull it? And I said, because I didn't have enough. And they said, you would have won. And I'm like, I didn't want the press. Maybe that would have been good press. I don't know. But yeah. that that actually led to um, uh, this couple of women who own a property in Green Valley and came to me and said, you know, we, we saw that you won best of class. We like your Pinot Noir. Can you take over farming our vineyard for us? Because we don't drink wine. We we bought this property. We don't have anyone caring for the vineyard. And you can just have all the fruit if you invest money into taking care of it. And so it's become really more or less my estate Pinot Noir since then. And, and I love the wine. It, it's turned out really well. So, and then the last set of wines I do. Um, so actually this is, I'll, I'll do some visuals. So this is our Pinot um, and our new label. So that's kind of the, the Pinot Noir. Um, and then um, I um, met a woman um, after my divorce and, and, um, we've since remarried this past summer, and she introduced me to um, some friends in Sonoma Valley who grow beautiful Merlot. And again, I've never been a big Merlot fan. Um, I always had a really nice cab under my belt, um, another grower that I'm really good friends with. And so in meeting Lori and George, um, all of a sudden I was connected to this really awesome Merlot vineyard, very close to Gunlock Bunchu. So now I do a Merlot, a cab, and this past year, They've started tea budding over um, some of their vines. So now we have Cab Merlot and Cab Franc in the same vineyard. Um, so this is the first blend of a Cab and Merlot. We call it Trois Amis. And the next vintage will be Cab Merlot and Cab Franc um, from all one vineyard, the Wheeler Vineyard. But this is how we've altered our, our new label for the blend. So basically, I've got a nice lineup of wines, and it allows me to get invited to do winemaker dinners because I've got enough wines to pair with everything. Um, I've dabbled in making sparkling Zinfandel and, and doing it by hand. And, and that's been fun. So that's kind of the lineup. 
Yeah, and thankfully for us, John does have a deep enough portfolio. By the way, how what is case production these days? Um, we're just this year we actually are hovering just under five hundred cases, roughly. <laughs> yeah, so. not exactly uh, huge, uh, right in that micro boutique area. We, uh, we but- do we do make wine for other people, and so the facility production is about five thousand cases now. Um, about a dozen clients that we produce wine for. So. And I'm the, I love the Viognier because it's so aromatic, but w- what are the aromas folks will be getting um, flavors? And then what do you pair with this? Well, in the 15 minutes, you probably will get spice, um, honeysuckle. Um, I find that there should be some melon coming out, a um, little bit of a floral note. Um, I really love pairing it with Asian cuisines, um, cuisines that have lots of rich, um, 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 good, now I'm forgetting it. Um, spice. Spices. Um, you know, curries. I, I think that, you know, coconut milk curry kind of dishes. Um, you know, I've done things with mango and, and curry and 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 fish or chicken. And um, a lot of those things really go well with it. So very nice. I like Chinese that. food. You know, it works well with Chinese food too. And I, I did want to let you know that if you think touring wine country in the United States is difficult and you need some assistance, John has a a fledgling business that he is doing now, because as you heard earlier, he spends half of his year in France. So in a small town called Quinsero. And so Anse. where are we located? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's what I said. Check the record. Um, where is Paris? Go all the way out. You're two and a half hours southeast. Oh, here we go. John's town is so important. It's the only one on the map. Yeah, I can see that. That's pretty cool. Uh, where are my borders and places and labels? This is going to get busy. Uh, all right, Paris. So this is, you said two and a half hours? Two and a half hours by car, yeah. Okay, and then and, so you're, go and, ahead. And just for, for, for sake of uh, letting people know what the lines mean. So keep it out there for a second. Um, all the lines are designating departments. So a department is kind of like a large county. Um, so you can see where we're on the line. Above us is the Ob, and below us is the Yon. And we are in the Yon. Um, but what's kind of cool is the Ob above us is the gateway to Champagne. It is the southernmost Champagne uh, department. And we're in the Yon, which is um, the, one of the northernmost um, Burgundy um, departments. Interesting. So just so, to kind of let you know. I think so, for those of us in the United States, these just look like gerrymandered voting districts. Yeah, so. That is true. Go over to Chablis. <laughs> That's, that, that everyone should know that Chablis is a real place um, that really makes wonderful Chardonnay. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. And this gives you an idea how close you are to Chablis. So your tour company and having people come and taste with you, I mean, it's going to be awesome because what what how far is this drive? So that's about a 40, 45 minute drive, plus or minus. Okay, okay so 20 miles, by the way, the crow flies. But uh, obviously, you're not doing that. Um, it's so- 20 minutes. It's a good 20 minute drive to Tonnerre. So Tonnerre is kind of in the middle and then another 20, well, 15, 20 minutes from Tonnerre. Tracy, so, is, Tracy is shaking her head saying I'm, I'm, I'm off by how many minutes? How many minutes am I off I by? Oh, so Tracy says it's 35 minutes to the nearest winery in Chablis, which she would know because she's cued in on that. And then also, wait, 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 wait. wait I'm wait, not wait. going anywhere. Well, you, you, perfect. Zoom in one more little time. You had another village that I saw that I wanted you to. Okay, perfect. Stop. Okay, to the right and up, you see the town of Les Rousset. That is our nearest Champagne village. And uh, they want produce beautiful Champagne in Les Rousset. Oh, I and forgot to show them your house too. And that's 15 minutes. Yeah, please do. So this is John's house in that town he pronounces that I don't know how to pronounce. They make fun of us too, uh, Martin. Uh, the mayor says, uh, he says, oh, Americans call it Kinserat. 
So just know that that even as an American there, they, they do make fun of us. Yes, that is our house. And it, it you can see the street view. Voila. Someone left the someone left the back door open. <laughs> That's it. Built in the eighteen hundreds. Awesome. That is a cute little village. And the, the next door neighbor that you're pointing at right now, her name is Janine. She keeps an eye on our house when we're not there. Um, she is a master gardener. And um, and and this year she she allowed me to use some of her land to plant beans. It was fun being in the garden with Janine. She's just a sweetheart. So people can contact you for private tastings in Sonoma. They can schedule if they're going to be in Chablis or kind of the north of Burgundy uh, because Champagne's two and a half hours or more away, is it not? The, no. The, like Roms? Oh, Roms. Roms? Roms is two hours north. Dijon or Bone is two hours south. So Roms, Dijon, but Le Risse, which have a wonderful number of wineries for Champagne, is right there. And then you have Chablis. And what we didn't mention is you have the village of Arancy, which produces Pinot Noir. And you have the village of Saint-Brie. Um, anyone here, and winemakers included, Anyone know what's unique about Saint Brie in Burgundy? Can anyone tell me? No guess. They are the, they're ahead. the only Burgundy village that produces a, a Sauvignon Blanc. Ooh, very interesting. And it's very Rebel. tasty. Rebel. Very tasty Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, John, as usual, very informative, very fun, uh, very helpful and educational. And I can't thank you enough for spending time uh, with a video card issue and a little bit under the weather uh, from that standpoint. See, now you're just doing that on purpose. To no, just... it really is going on. <laughs> uh -huh. I like the prompting. Um, find the SIP episodes. Uh, Mission Control already put them in the chat line. Go ahead and click on that. By the way, uh, next Friday, we are off. Uh, so because uh, the following Friday begins sweeps week, so we're preparing. And it's very important that we hit the spring semester, uh, you know, guns ablazing. So February 17th, Barry Waite of Tambor Bay will be joining us because Tambor Bay is kicking off a new Pinot program. There might be someone on tonight's broadcast that knows a thing or two about the Pinot grape. Looking at you, Vance. Um, everyone be good to one another, have fun this weekend. Thank you all for your support. Can't do this without you, John Phillips, Tracy. Thank you to the crowd there. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend. Cheers all my glasses. Well, bon weekend, everyone. Bon weekend. Bye-bye.